Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. If you're new around here, my name's Ryan from Tragedy Tales, and on this channel, every week, we cover anything tragic, including caving, plane crashes, and more. But in this video, we're going back to our roots. We're going to take a look at two times where normal caving trips turned into absolute horror. Draw the curtains, grab a drink. This is caving gone wrong. In 2005, it was a completely normal day for five people as they sat around a table enjoying dinner together. Now this is when the topic of caves was brought up. The group were all from Utah and it consisted of 21 year old Jennifer. She was part of a band and was known for her love of adventure, along with her 24 year old boyfriend Blake Donner. Accompanied by Scott K. McDonald, who was 28, Joseph Ferguson who was 26, and the youngest of the group, Ariel Singer she was 18. As they continued to talk about caves, Jennifer started to describe a hole in the ground that she'd found on a recent hike. You'd completely miss it if you weren't looking for it. The entrance looked like a deep, dark slash in the ground located around 1200 feet southwest of the Y Mountain, just off the campus of the Brigham Young University in Provo. The cave wasn't all that big. It ran for a total of 100 feet below, but at the time, it was not known to officials and its location was only spread by word of mouth. Essentially, you'd jam yourself into the hole in the ground and then proceed to crawl through a very tight claustrophobic passage with cold water running below you. After some tight crawls and squeezes, at the end splits into a pitchfork-like formation. To the right of the pitchfork doesn't really lead anywhere, but to the left was a 15-foot passage that got tighter and tighter and got more and more wet as it did so eventually leading into a completely flooded passage. But just beyond this passage is a chamber that has breathable air, suitable for six to eight people. If you're brave enough, there's a rope installed from the start of the submerged part all the way to the chamber. Now this is what the group were most interested in. The lore of the cavern under the surface sounds like a challenge and a thrill. Of course, getting to the chamber comes with many risks. When you're swimming in silty cave passages, Clear water can quickly become murky, so it's very easy to become disoriented. Not to forget that the passage is also fairly tight and completely flooded. Absolutely anything could go wrong. Now the cave itself is actually both a mine and a cave. It was originally mined when they found a vein at the back of a natural cave, but it was then left abandoned. It's officially known as Gollum's Cave. The group laughed and joked, and Jennifer insisted that they go that same night eerily naming it the Cave of Death. So on that fateful night, August the 17th, 2005, the group packed backpacks with torches and water bottles and left the house wearing just shorts and sandals. The moon loomed above, glowing a yellowy white as the group looked for the entrance. And after a while of searching in the dark, eventually they arrived at their destination. It was around 3 a.m. Kneeling down and peering in, it was pitch black and had water running in it at a decent pace. So the group took a look at it and without a second thought, Jennifer was first to squeeze herself into the ground. One by one, they disappeared into the cave. They began crawling through the passage with the cold water constantly running beneath their hands. They reached the fork and headed down the left passageway and they reached the flooded sump. Joseph was last in the group and he sat there and watched as the other four descended into the water, squeezing and contorting themselves to fit down the hole and into the flooded chamber. But just watching this, Joseph had a sinking feeling in his stomach that something wasn't quite right. After seeing the image of his friend submerge, he decided he didn't quite fancy the idea of swimming into the abyss. He made the correct decision to proceed no further. He turned around, crawled through the passage and waited at the entrance. He sat on a rock and he waited and waited, but they never appeared. 45 minutes passed and Joseph began to worry. He phoned a friend who had been in the cave who said that 45 minutes was way too long to be down there and to phone the police immediately. He frantically dialed 911 and police arrived at around 4.30 a.m. But they quickly discovered that there was nothing that the police department could do. The police department trains each year for cave rescues, but this rescue was different as it involved water, something that they had not trained for. So a specialist rescue team from a neighboring city was called in to assist. 
As this was an unknown cave and had not yet been mapped, they had no idea how long it extended for or how they would even go about rescuing the trapped people inside. They tried to enter the cave themselves, but this was deemed far too dangerous to attempt. So they focused on getting water out of the cave. They installed pumps and used them to pump water out of the cave and fresh air in to replenish oxygen if the group were trapped. They could do nothing but wait for the pumps to work their magic. But by the time the pumps were successfully installed and working, the hot summer sun began to rise. It was now 7.30 a.m. and the group was still nowhere to be seen. Joseph was still sitting by the entrance, thinking about the decision that he made to turn around. He hoped and prayed that his friends were still somehow alive. The water finally began to drop in the cave at around 8.30. Rescuers were shocked when they looked in the passage. The water had lowered and revealed Jennifer laying face down. The way she was lying, it was clear that she was coming back from the cavern, but the remainder of the group was still not yet found. As the water continued to drop, it revealed the full scale of the disaster. Tragically, the remainder of the group were discovered directly behind Jennifer, all in single file, all looking like they were on their way out when something went terribly wrong. Around noon, the remaining three teens were packed up and extracted from the cave. People at first were bemused, but after some investigation and by looking at the evidence, it's fairly easy to at least assume what happened here. There are two scenarios that are most commonly believed. It's a fact that Jennifer led the group and dove in first, but what exactly caused her to drown is not 100% confirmed. As the passage is tight and silty, she could have lost visibility and taken in water. They had torches with them, but they didn't work underwater, and even if they did, they wouldn't have been able to see anything. Or it's thought that her clothing may have become caught in rocky outcrops, stopping her from continuing on. Either way, she would have had no time to communicate this back to the group, who were still sitting in the cavern. So they too would have dove in and tried to make their way through the water, only to find that Jennifer was now blocking the way. There would have been no way to turn around. Now the other scenario is that the group made their way under the water into the cavern to be met by extremely foul air. This meant that there was no oxygen to breathe and they would have been forced to make the trip back in a panic. It's quite possible that Jennifer could have passed out due to lack of air. Regardless, this was a true tragedy for the residents of Utah. Families were distraught that they'd lost loved ones at such young ages. Jennifer's parents knew that she loved adventure, but never thought that it would get her killed. In the following days, the entrance was filled with cement to prevent any further tragedies from occurring. Officials stated that nobody should visit these caves if they don't know the layout or if they're not prepared. Anything can go wrong and it can leave you stranded further below than you might think. And now the cave that was once known as Gollum's Cave was now widely known as the Cave of Death. This story begins in Dolgeville, some 200 miles northwest of New York City. On February the 15th, 1965, a 23-year-old man named James, along with two of his friends, set off to explore the local Schroeder's Pants Cave. This cave was one of the most beautiful but challenging caves in New York. James, or as his friends called him, Jim, had been to the cave entrance to examine it, but decided he'd come back at a later date to explore it. That morning was typical of northeast winters. It was a very cold, snowy day. He, accompanied by his two friends, Hedy Miller and Charles Bennett, had met at the Boston Grotto of the National Speleological Society, and all three were very active members. Jim was an avid and enthusiastic young caver, and was always prepared for his adventures. He actually won the annual award from the National Speleological Society for outstanding scientific papers. Some days before leaving for the cave entrance, he paid a visit to the person who owned the land that the cave was situated. This man was called George Lyon and he was an expert caver. He and a friend discovered the cave in the 1950s and it was named Schroeder's Pants because one of them ripped their pants on their first explore. The cave was actually on his back garden. It was a sort of family thing. Generations of his family had been down there and it was almost fully explored. While he was there, he gave him drawings of the cave some equipment, and some general do's and don'ts. 
The cave entrance was hidden in some shrubbery at the back of George's garden, but George wouldn't be there to supervise on the day that Jim had planned to explore. Armed with new information and equipment, a few days later, Jim and his two spelunking friends headed to the cave entrance. The three of them trekked for nearly a mile in knee-deep snow to get to the cave. Jim hung a rope and the three descended about 50 feet into the cave. Here, they made their way through various tight tunnels in the pitch black until they opened up into a large chamber, around 235 feet from the entrance. In the middle of the chamber was an eerie, dark, vertical shaft, around 75 feet in length, leading to another cave. It was decently wide at the start, but as it went down, it got tighter and tighter and tighter. Right at the bottom, it looked like you could just about fit through. This was the part of the cave where George, the landowner, had never explored. The recent warm weather had melted snow, causing a float of water down the hole. Jim, being an avid caver, began hooking and rigging to descend down. His friends watched in suspense as he hooked himself and lowered down into the ice-cold stream of water, gasping as he did. It was a lot colder than he expected. He then slowly let slack off the cord to descend down the passage. As he was making his way down, the stream of water above him suddenly became more prevalent. It came pounding down from above, attacking him from every angle. It's said that 10 gallons of 35 degree water, or 1 Celsius, began pouring on his head every single minute. He began to hurry up to try to make it to the bottom, and this is when tragedy struck. Suddenly, he stopped descending and his line got tangled and caught one of his arms in a twist. He tried with all of his force, but he just couldn't free himself. He thought, nope, I'm getting out of here, and he tried to climb up the rope to safety. But as he tried to pull himself up, after a whole day's caving and a big trek to get to the entrance, he didn't have enough strength nor the grip to pull himself up. He attempted to use his prussic knots to raise himself, but they were jammed and freezing. He took off his gloves to work the knots, but they were so swollen with water, he could no longer undo them. His friends, perched at the top, had to witness the whole ordeal unfold in front of them. Upon realizing the situation was far worse than they first thought, they tried to pull on the ropes to get him out of the shaft by hand, heaving and pulling, using all of their weight behind them. But Jim was around 13 stone. The cave was very tight and there just wasn't enough leverage to heave him up. For 45 minutes, they strained to try to lift him, but it proved an impossible task. Jim considered cutting the cord and taking the fall, but it was unlikely he would survive a 75 foot drop. He was stuck. It was clear that they weren't getting anywhere, so one of his friends left the cave to find help. He rushed to a local town, and around 7.30pm, the alarm bell was rung for Jim. But time was of the essence. The Spelunker was constantly being bombarded with almost freezing water. If left for too long, his body temp would drop, and hypothermia would soon begin to set in. Only with the best team did Jim stand a chance of making it out of the cave. So, a six-man specialist rescue squad was flown in from Washington to lead the recovery effort on the vice president's plane, Air Force Two, making national news. But you'd be surprised. Apparently, the specialist team consisted of six young men that had virtually no experience. James's rescue was actually their big test. As rescue was on their way, his friends stayed at the top of the passage, comforting and assuring him that he would make it out to safety. Before anyone knew it, a crowd of 40 people arrived on the surface. Seven were with the state police and coroner, four were there as medical support, and the rest were family as they knew the cave well. They entered the cave to see what could be done, but by the time the rescue had arrived from Washington, he had gone quiet. They made their way down the pit to the chamber and shouted to him, but there was no reply back. One of the rescue teams lowered another rope to him and grabbed him by the arm, but just by grabbing him, they instantly knew that he had already passed away. His skin was ice cold to the touch. They checked his pulse with the stethoscope and none was found. The message was relayed to the surface that this had now turned from a rescue to a recovery effort. The coroner on the surface pronounced him dead. His official cause of death was hypothermia due to exposure. So they focused on getting him out of the cave by any means necessary. They tried many different methods of extraction, heaving and tugging, reseating him, drilling a series of pulleys, but he just would not move. They began to work on narrow parts of the cave to make more room for leverage. The recovery turned from hours into days, and three days later, after mapping the cave and drilling numerous holes in the rock, Jim was finally ready for recovery. As they began to pull on his body, suddenly the back end of the cave started to collapse. 
making recovering his body that much harder. They still tried, but rock and mud began falling from the ceiling, and they feared that the entire cave would collapse. They were forced to call it a day. They cut the rope that was holding him and slowly let him down to the bottom of the passage. They then made the decision to close the cave for good. They used dynamite to collapse the entrance shut and officially made Schroeder's cave his tomb. Over 500,000 US dollars was spent in an effort to retrieve him. A headstone was placed on top, reading James Gentry Mitchell. While exploring Schroeder's pants cave, Jim died from exposure to the waterfall. He lies sleeping forever in the cave that he loved. He is not forgotten by society or his friends. The specialist rescue team had a lot to answer for and had to overcome many obstacles if they wanted to continue their work. They said, and I quote, we had done a lot of practicing, but boy, was that cave tight. They were kept together and went on to do a few more cave rescues, but it was ultimately shut down after a few short years. His death sent waves through the potholing community. It made a lot of people question why there was no local cave rescue. For George and his family, the cave had suddenly become a gravesite in their back garden. Sadly, this tomb was not as secure as they thought. A couple of years after the incident, other parts of the interconnecting caves were discovered and they actually led to the bottom of the shaft, his final resting place. It was reported that a handful of people visited his skeletal remains. He lay there bundled in rope, caving gear loosely hung around bones, still wearing his helmet with 16 notches in it to show how many caves that he had entered. Here, Jim rested for 41 years. Until 2003, the grandson of George Lyon, Christian Lyon, decided that Jim deserved a proper burial. With permission from his surviving family, Christian and many other spelunkers from upstate Kentucky, Georgia, Michigan, and Ohio planned to recover Jim's body in his documentary that he was doing about the event, named Tragic Exposure, which I was unable to find while writing this script. Three years later, around 1am on June the 26th, 2006, after four hours of hard work, Jim was finally recovered. After the recovery, Christian said, and I quote, After I got out, I started to stumble, and a wave of emotion just engulfed me. I was freezing. My grandfather found that cave, everyone in my family had explored the cave, and for the last three years of my life, I've devoted myself to getting Jim out. Finally, getting him home was just overwhelming. Jim was then cremated. Some of his ashes were left with his family, and the rest were spread near the cave. His 89-year-old father, along with many of his family, were finally able to end this terrible chapter, and Jim was finally allowed to rest after 41 years of being in a cave. But that was just two times where caving went terribly wrong. These videos aren't to deter anyone from caving, as caving is a pretty safe sport, but these stories just double down on the fact that when accidents occur, they are usually catastrophic. Don't forget, if you appreciated this video, be sure you've tapped that like button. And if you're into true horror such as this, be sure to tap that subscribe button. But I will see you in the next one. Bye bye.